Professor Rogoff, thank you very much indeed for joining us at the India Risk Awards uh, function. It's a pleasure and uh, it's a pleasure to be interviewed by you in person. <laughs> oh, thank you. Yes, we've had a lot of long distance interviews. You've been kind enough to give CNBC TV 18. But my, the first uh, question I want to ask you is, is there a risk that there isn't such a deep global uh, financial risk at all? I mean, the, uh, the global financial crisis of 2008, uh, a similar measure of crisis is perhaps the Great Depression of 1929. Maybe we are too much the children of the 2008 crisis that we probably are looking for crisis every time. No, I, I, I certainly, as I, <clears throat> as I said at the introduction of my talk, m our book says they happen decades apart. They don't happen one on top of another. And I gave that reassuring message for a long time. But then I sort of watched the world unfold in front of me with Trump and Brexit and the trade war. And, you know, a part, part of a crisis are technical things in the system, but part of it's the handling. Also, we've done massive deregulation. Usually, everybody's scared. Regulations very heavy, repressive, one might say, and it takes decades before it unwinds. Now it's happened almost in the blink of an eye. So I, I don't want to overstate it. That it's mu it's not. It, it's much much more likely. <coughs> we just <coughs> excuse me. We just have a normal recession than we have a, another deep systemic crisis. But I no longer dismiss the possibility. I don't feel, you know, as safe as I did even a couple of years ago. Now suddenly I'm feeling unsafe. Huh. Uh, well, uh, before I come to this normal recession that you think we may be heading into, uh, I last interviewed you on CNBC TV 18 as part of 10 years of Lehman crisis. So it was September of 2018. At that time, the 10-year yield in the United States was almost heading to 3.2 and on a, on a certain day uh, I guess it did touch uh, it, it went even past 3.2 and we were all wondering if uh, 3.25 would be uh, yeah. some kind of a technical trade that uh, would result uh, in some kind of a crisis but we've since moved a long way today the rate is 2.67 uh, so what's your sense uh, uh, is global growth slowing so much that the Fed should have completely done this about face? Well, first of all, um, there's been a increasing gap between what you get for investing in stocks and what you get for investing in bonds, and stock returns have been high, and that's another measure of what investors expect growth to be, but certainly um, <clears throat> very narrowly on your question about the Fed. I don't think anybody has any idea. Uh, nobody knows what's normal anymore. Uh, and so there's a, there's a view that it's just drifting down and down and down. There was a, a paper that made the rounds maybe a year ago saying it's really demographics and it's inequality. And demographics and inequality are both set to keep getting worse and worse. But I think we're not sure. I, I think anyone who expresses any confidence about what it's going to be in 20 years uh, is kidding themselves. And it comes to risk management, and I, I, I'd like to highlight how the United States is managing its federal debt. Uh, it's very short. It's maybe the shortest duration, that's a technical term for measuring the average length, that it's been since the high inflation 70s. So that's a very cheap way to borrow. But if interest rates go up, it's very risky. So I wouldn't say so much that interest rates are definitely going to go up. I would say the betting is clear that they're not, and they might go down. But I think in terms of macroeconomic risk management, one needs to take account of the fact it could unwind. It could go the other way. Uh, well, uh, if we are looking at uh, 300,000 plus jobs getting created a month, uh, then is there really that kind of slowdown? Is somebody mispricing something? Oh, I think the United States is doing really well. I mean, the United States is booming. Uh, productivity, I think, will pick up. Investment's not as good as we'd like to see, but people are just pouring into the jobs market. Uh, the unemployment rate's actually not been falling. It's been rising because so many people who were sort of 
pulled out of the job market they thought it was hopeless but if you look at the world as i said china really does seem to be slowing down more than the official number the official numbers oh it you know it was 6.5 instead of 6.6 .6. you've got to be kidding that statistical error no it probably slowed down a lot i i think in europe that's what germany's feeling that's what a lot of asia's feeling so uh, looking more broadly globally that's much slower and the whole world affects interest rates it's not just the united states okay. no so your uh, uh, is it more likely that the risks to the global financial system and uh, the global economy could stem more from china uh, and china slowing down much more rapidly than what we are accounting for well i mean i i think that's the thing we see and i would say it's more acute than the conventional wisdom when i talk to people at the world economic forum they say oh the chinese will just do stimulus it's no problem they're just being a little careful they've already careful. done some they've already done some but it it hasn't been as effective as it was in the past because the a big part of their stimulus was through construction a big part of construction was housing and it's starting to reach the end of the line when you have your poor country it's still very poor compared to europe and they have the same housing per capita the same square meters a huge amount of employment there it's it's a very delicate and the ha there's really some downward pressure on housing prices now they can do things to push it up but that could make it just worse later uh in the united states as well the federal reserve uh, has kind of uh, pulled back in terms of interest rate uh, uh, hikes and now is looking in terms of a slowdown uh, you know how much ammunition does it have if uh, you know a, a slowdown genuinely hit i mean uh, is uh, is there that much space for quantitative easing or uh, you know once again bloating its balance sheet is it prepared for a slowdown no it's not it'll tell you that it is that we've invented these new tools so they have room to cut interest rates 2.5% but in a typical recession they cut them 5 or 6% quantitative easing is smoke and mirrors i think a lot of research my book uh summarizes a lot of it has shown that quantitative easing in the united states is one branch of the government buying the debt of another branch of the government the federal reserve is nominally independent but it is owned lock stock and barrel by the treasury the treasury owns its profits uh, it's different in europe where the germans may be buying italian debt so i i think the early view that quantitative easing pure quantitative easing did something people don't have confidence now the, the fed says that's okay we have other tricks we'll convince you that if there's a recession and the interest rates gets to zero we're going to convince you that later will allow inflation to rise above 2%. Okay. But what just happened as soon as the inflation rate started reaching 2% they started raising interest rates. So I don't think that convinces anyone. No, I I'm I mean not to get into extremely wonkish territory but I think the future being the next 10 to 20 years holds an entirely new regime in these emergency situations and this will sound blasphemy but even allowing interest rates to be significantly negative when all else fails okay. oh yes so we almost contemplated that i think about 2 years ago 2015 didn't we well many countries did it yes yes japan did for sure japan uh sweden denmark uh the european union to a small extent your eurozone to a small extent okay but well, we uh, we had on cnbc tv 18 professor ed altman just a couple of days back uh -huh. and he was speaking about exactly the same problem of uh, accumulation of corporate debt uh, in in the united states non financial corporate debt he says is 100% of gdp and just 20 years ago it was 50% of gdp and 10 years ago it was 66% of gdp so it's grown i mean uh, exponentially if you looked at the history of corporate debt so his uh, reading is that if a recession comes now and if it's slightly deeper than it uh, uh, you know that people are prepared for then there can be very huge defaults is that a, a, a likely risk 
Well, absolutely, it could happen. The question is, how much will it blow up? Because if you look at normal recessions, there are also a lot of corporate defaults. If you, you know, go back to 1983, 1991, uh, cor corporate defaults are common. There have been periods, I think, when 10% of the value of corporate debt has defaulted. But the question is, who holds it? If it's in, you know, some pension plans, wealthy individuals, uh, you know, held internationally, it's very painful, it makes it hard to raise money, but it doesn't blow up the system. The question is how much of it might come back to the banking system and then need to get bailed out by the taxpayer and then end in a big debate about what we should do or shouldn't do. Officially, it's not that much. But I think no one knows whether some of these loans, which is called the shadow banking sector, going to the corporate debt, will that boomerang into banks' balance sheets? I, I've asked regulators about that, and they assure me not. I've asked academics like Anad Admati at Stanford, whose work I admire very much, and she's not so sure. Highly leveraged corporates, and the leverage now is coming undone. They are unable to pay. We've, have a, we've had a huge bad debt problem, uh, something like 13% of the total banking assets yeah. of the country. And India is a heavily bank-financed uh, bank country. M uh, might I say that's a very large percentage considering you're in a boom and not a recession? Exactly. And, um, uh, I mean, how would you look at that? The, the only reason why that's not blowing up as people running for their money or uh, leading to a run of the banks is because 70% of the banking system is owned by the government. So no one cares. Your money is safe. But what's the end game for this? So much leverage. And uh, uh, now it's going, while we thought that we have recognized and are trying to resolve the banking uh, bad loan problem, it looks like the non-bank finance uh, guys have gotten some of the, ba or a large part of the bad loans and they've been ever greening it. Uh, have you studied this problem and do you think this can get nastier than what you're prepared for? Well, I, I haven't studied it personally. I've read about it. Uh, so my impression is that the Indian government in the last years has made significant progress on this and so is the Reserve Bank of India that this is really an area where after years and years of doing nothing and, and it, they're finally moving to try to squeeze this out and it's important because other firms that are healthy need to borrow and the banking system can't perform its function. By the way, there's some of this going on in France in Italy where the banking system has not healed from their euro debt crisis. It's absolutely been a factor in holding back their growth. But I think for India, this is a long-term problem. I, I think you have to work it out. But in the meantime, uh, maybe opening up a little bit more to foreign capital flows, which don't want to go into China right now, and it, they would love to go into India, might, might be helpful. I, by the way, I say that direct, not short-term borrowing, long-term borrowing, direct foreign investment, uh, there are opportunities for India to try to keep the economy moving while the banking system's healing. Oh yes, uh, uh, we could do with a little more capital. Until now, Indian development is largely financed yes. domestically, uh, which perhaps is also uh, makes it uh, less risky because we, we haven't uh, uh, been shocked by a sudden uh, outflow of, uh, of foreign capital. But just to stick to the ownership of banks, is that a big risk for India, the 70% ownership of the banking system by the government? Uh, I mean, year after year, decade after decade, can the taxpayer be bailing out? And is there a sense of, uh, you know, uh, being not alive to risk simply because you're owned by the sovereign? You know, it's funny. When I came here in 2002, I think at the time, I may not have the number right, India's government debt was 70 or 80 percent of GDP. I mean, it's about 70 percent now. And the state deficits were particularly out of control. And you know, people say, well, what's the problem with it? And I would say, well, the problem is that you can manage it, but you have to do it by making it hard for anybody else to borrow. And that's the situation now, that you can keep evergreening the loans by favoring the state banks, by uh, 
favoring the, these firms, the so-called evergreening, where you make bad loans on top of good loans, but it doesn't yield for a dynamic economy. And trying to clean it up would certainly help raise India's growth rate, maintain India's growth rate, make it more dynamic, um, have it div uh, manage risk better if you could do this. Uh, again, there have been, there've been steps taken. You're, you're raising an issue where I think actually I would point to progress, a lot of progress since, uh, since I came in 2002. But as you say, there's a lot of room to, to go. Uh, yes, leverage is certainly an issue and non-bank or shadow bank uh, leverage has suddenly become the talking point since, uh, uh, well actually since uh, last August when uh, we thought the Federal Reserve will raise rates uh, and uh, uh, you know, globally uh, U.S. yields will go and, beyond. And by the way, one of the problems with this sudden pause, they were raising it and then they paused, is if there is, you asked about growth in the U.S., what if there is inflation? What if they've gotten behind the curve? Then everything that we were worried would happen will happen faster and harder. And so you could have a bigger mess ahead. I hope they called it right, but they've taken a, they've taken a risk that inflation does come, that growth is too fast, and then everything you were worrying about a few months ago could be worse. Yep. Yeah, but I guess Chinese slowdown is working in their favor at this juncture, keeping global inflation down. I, I don't know about that because it's more of a productivity slowdown that could end up just reducing the Asian surplus. The Asian surplus was an excess of saving, holding interest rates down. So normally, that's the normal thinking. I've written otherwise and had people disagree with me, but I, I think it's not, not so clear that it's going to push interest rates down. Okay. Oh, well, uh, I, I want to talk to you about another risk altogether, which uh, you know, uh, which uh, we thought uh, you know but, uh, will get resolved, or all of us think will get resolved in that 90-day period. The trade war risk. Uh, what's the chance that the U.S. and China will reach an agreement in that 90 days, which I think is now only 30 days uh, uh, residual? I don't know. I, I think this is a very long-term issue, and this is one of these things. If you read a lot of the press around President Trump, he's wrong. He's always wrong. Whatever he does is wrong. And this one, if I would say his logic is wrong, but nevertheless, he's taken on China, and he's brought everyone with him. Everyone in Congress now is behind it. They, they, you wouldn't get the Democrats to admit that they were following Trump and doing it, but this whole idea of respecting intellectual property rights, of forced technology transfer, has, it's, it's got to be settled. And I don't know how easily the Chinese are willing to move on this. And so this is something that could be around for a while. Bernie Sanders was the big thing in the last 2016. His, he, he was a different personality than Trump, is an understatement, uh -huh. but he had the same trade policy, basically, and if I were the Democrats, I wouldn't be arguing with Trump's trade policy, which is very popular in the heartlands, and even among intellectuals who dislike Trump have to say, well, you know, maybe it took you know, somebody breaking China, so to speak, you know, to, to get something done. So, no, I don't, I don't know how this is going to play out. I hope in the short run they move it to pulling off the immediate trade war, pulling off the immediate pressures, restoring the possibility that it will be dis resolved rationally. But I, I've really come to the conclusion that it's, it's on the Chinese to make a move here. I don't know if they can. But if you don't get an agreement, uh, does it get just rolled over or... Uh, do you think uh, you know, there can be an, uh, a, 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 a steepening, a rise in tariffs uh, if an no, agreement it, doesn't happen? It, no, it can, get a lot of it can get a lot worse. There are a lot of egos and tempers. This, is, this isn't going to be a physical war, but this is how wars start. This is how problems start. And there are going to be a lot of innocent bystanders, any small countries which depend on the global trading system. It's gotten much worse than I thought it could two years ago. And I fear we may not have seen the end. I hope okay. we have, but I don't know. Okay. Well, just a final uh, word on the, uh, uh, you know, the trade war. Uh, there were, there are articles which uh, now believe that this kind of 
populist nationalism uh, is probably a new era that would last the next 30 years. I mean, you had the era of Keynesianism, which lasted probably from 1945 to 1975. And thereafter, you had Thatcherism and Reaganism and, uh, you know, China and Soviet Union moving towards markets. So there was this predominance of markets, which probably ended with the great financial crisis. And now a third era, which is populist nationalism. Do you think that that's how we should look at it, that there are going to be 30 years or maybe a couple of decades of populist nationalism? I, I'm more optimistic, okay. cautiously more optimistic. You mentioned Keynesianism. That was an idea, and it worked. There was uh, sort of freeing up markets, which happened all over the world. It was an idea, and for a long time, it worked. This populist nationalism, there isn't really an idea. Okay. And the ideas of let's make everything free, right. uh, let's give everyone the same income, let's have you know, uh, a socialist system, it no, doesn't work. It doesn't uh, work. Basically, anti-globalization. Do you think that that will be an idea which will catch fancy, and uh, you know you will see less of WTO, uh, more of trade barriers, uh, for for maybe a couple of decades now? Uh, well. We may see some of it, but I don't think it'll last 30 years. It doesn't work. There'll be a backlash. So I think there needs to be redistribution of income. We need to deal with income inequality. This is not the way to do it. Okay. Well, on that hopeful note that globalization is not ended and that trade wars and huge trade barriers are not a risk that we will be heading into. Thank you very much, Professor Agoff, for joining us. Thank you so much for speaking to me.